Hello and welcome to lesson 16 of 20 in the URSA campus breakdown course on introductory statistics and probability. This is module four, introduction to inferential statistics, part two, point estimates and confidence intervals comparing two populations. Let's get started. In the previous lesson, we introduced the concepts of point and confidence interval estimates and focused upon the latter as a means of estimating population parameters to specified levels of confidence. We also examined the trade-off between precision and level of confidence for a given set of sample data. And we considered how sample size can influence both precision and level of confidence. While the previous lesson was limited to looking only at single populations one at a time, in this lesson, we extend the concepts of confidence intervals to examine how they can be used to estimate differences between two populations. The topics covered in this lesson include why the difference between two population parameters, point estimates for the difference between two population means or proportions, confidence intervals for the difference between two population means or proportions broken down into population means for independent samples and for paired samples and finally population proportions. Much of the work in statistics involves comparing populations and trying to answer the question of is there a difference between them or are they the same? with respect to some attribute of interest. Examples of such questions we might be interested in answering include the following. Are house prices on average the same in two different towns? Does a certain brand of decaffeinated coffee have an overall effect on the heart rate of people who drink it? Is there a difference between the germination rates of two different sources of lettuce seeds? We now proceed to examine ways to use sampling to generate estimates that can help us answer questions such as these. If we are interested in comparing two population means mu1 and mu2, then we can start by considering the following. If mu1 equals mu2, therefore mu1 minus mu2 equals zero, in other words, the difference is zero, if mu1 is greater than mu2, then mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero, and the difference is positive. And if mu1 is less than mu2, then mu1 minus mu2 is less than zero, which means that the difference is negative. As discussed previously, unless we are able to conduct a census, we cannot determine with certainty the values for either mu1 or mu2. Therefore, we rely upon taking samples from both populations and generating estimates from the sample data. Since, as we have seen earlier, X bar provides us with an unbiased point estimate for mu, we can refine this definition to say that in general, X bar I gives us an unbiased point estimate for mu I. In other words, for two populations one and two, X bar one is an unbiased estimator of mu one, and X bar two is an unbiased estimator of mu two. In the case of estimating the difference of two population means, therefore, we can say in general that if random samples are obtained from two populations with means mu one and mu two, then the difference between the sample means X bar one minus X bar two represents an unbiased point estimate for the difference between the population means, mu1 minus mu2. In example one, in the previous month, 15 houses were sold in Palooka town with a mean selling price of $265,500 and a standard deviation of $35,000. During the same month, there were 12 houses sold in Smallville with a mean selling price of $239,000 and a standard deviation of $21,000. Assuming that these sale prices represent resale values generally for houses in each community, and also assuming that these values tend to follow a roughly normal distribution, 
calculate an unbiased point estimate for the difference in the mean house value between the two communities. So to answer this question, we start by defining a few things. We let mu1 equal the mean house resale value in Palooka Town and mu2 equal the mean house resale value in Smallville. So that means that population one is in Palooka Town and population two is in Smallville. Therefore, an unbiased point estimate for mu1 minus mu2 will equal x bar 1 minus x bar 2, and we have that information from each sample. So that equals the difference between 265,500 and 239,000, which equals 26,500. In other words, based on the obtained samples, it is estimated that on average, house resale values in Palooka Town are $26,500 more than for houses in Smallville. The calculation of a point estimate for the difference between two population proportions is done similarly to the difference between two population means. In other words, if random samples are obtained from two populations with proportions P1 and P2, then the difference between the sample proportions, P bar 1 minus P bar 2, represents an unbiased point estimate for the difference between the population means, P1 minus P2. In example two, a market gardener wants to compare the germination rates of two varieties of lettuce seeds, white costs and long romaine. A sample of 200 white cost seeds is sowed, of which 115 germinate. Meanwhile, a sample of 100 long romaine seeds is sowed, of which 67 germinate. And we're to calculate an unbiased point estimate of the difference between the germination rates for the two varieties of lettuce seed. So to answer this question, we proceed similarly as in the previous example. This time we define P1 as the germination rate for all white cost lettuce seeds and P2 as the germination rate for all long romaine lettuce seeds. Therefore, an unbiased point estimate for P1 minus P2 is equal to P bar 1 minus P bar 2, which equals, and we calculate the, the ratios the way we calculate proportions from samples, equals 115 over 200, that's for, from sample 1, minus 67 over 100, that's from sample 2. And so we get 0.575 minus 0.67, which gives us an answer of minus 0.095. As discussed in the previous lesson, the main problem with point estimates is that they have zero confidence associated with them. And this is true as well in the case of comparisons between two samples. Therefore, as before, we require interval estimates in order to meet LOC criteria. For estimating the difference between two population means equal mu1 minus mu2, where the samples taken from each population are independent of each other, we proceed as follows. We call this the CI mu1 minus mu2, and it equals the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error, ME, which equals x bar 1 minus x bar 2, that's the point estimate, plus or minus ME. Now, if we know sigma 1 and sigma 2, then we can use the normal distribution and the formula for the confidence interval becomes CI mu1 minus mu2 equals x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus or minus z alpha over 2 times sigma for x bar 1 minus x bar 2, which then equals x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus or minus z alpha over 2 times the square root of sigma 1 squared over n1 plus sigma 2 squared over n2. However, as also discussed previously, if we do not know mu1 and mu2, which of course is why we are trying to estimate their difference in the first place, then we are not likely to know sigma1 and sigma2 either. Therefore, as with confidence intervals for single populations, we use s as an estimate for sigma. In other words, S1 for sigma 1 and S2 for sigma 2. Accordingly, 
the t distribution is used in place of z, and the formula for the confidence interval becomes as follows. Ci mu1 minus mu2 is approximately equal to x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus or minus the t for alpha over 2 and degrees freedom equals the minimum of n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1 times the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. Now note in the formula above that we use df equals the min of n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1, which means the minimum or the lesser of the degrees of freedom for each individual sample. Now the derivation of degrees of freedom for the difference of two sample means is left for further study. But it is worth noting here that other formulas are used among statisticians in place of the one that we're using here. And there is no single common consensus on which degrees of freedom formula is best in this situation. For the purpose of this course, however, we will use df equals the min of n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1 for differences between two population means, as it provides a conservatively low value for the degrees of freedom, which in turn yields a wider confidence interval that provides an actual level of confidence slightly greater, if anything, than the prescribed LOC. We now look at an example where confidence intervals of this type are calculated. In example three, we return to the data from example one on house sale prices in Palooka Town and Smallville, with the sample data summarized in the table at right. So we see the table on the slide, and it contains for each of the towns uh, the information for the sample size, X bar, and S. And we're asked to answer the following questions. In part A, we are asked to calculate 90%, 95%, and 99% confidence intervals for the difference between the average resale value of houses in the two communities. And in part B, we're asked to comment on how the results at each LOC might support or not support a claim that house resale prices on average are higher in Palooka Town versus in Smallville. So to answer this example, we start with defining mu1, we say that we let mu1 equal the, so for part A, we let mu1 equal the mean house resale value in Palooka Town and mu2 equal the mean house resale value in Smallville. So with that defined, the formula that we're going to use is we're going to calculate a confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2, which is equal to x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus or minus the t with alpha over 2 and df equals the min of n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1 times the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. So substituting the information that we have, that gives us 265,500 minus 239,000 plus or minus the t value for remembering that alpha is 1 minus LOC. So in, for all three confidence intervals, it will be 1 minus LOC over 2. And degrees freedom being the minimum of 15 minus 1 and 12 minus 1 times the square root of 35,000 squared divided by 15 plus 21,000 squared divided by 12. So that gives us a confidence interval equal to 26,500 plus or minus T for one minus LOC over two. And the degrees of freedom in all three confidence intervals will be 11 because that's the, the minimum of 15 minus one, which is 14 and 12 minus one, which is 11. So we use 11 times the square root of 35,000 squared over 15 plus 21,000 squared over 12. So we calculate the confidence intervals as follows. For the three levels of confidence, the formula is going to be the same except for the t value, which is going to be different because we're going to have for each level of confidence a different value of alpha over 2. Now, those values of alpha over 2 respectively for between 90%, 95%, and 99% are 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and 0 0.005. 
And if we look up in the t table, the values of t, and what we do is we look in the row for df equals 11, and then we look at the corresponding column, depending on what our alpha over 2 is, we see that we get t values of 1.796, 2.201, and 3.106, respectively. So substituting all of this into the formula for the confidence interval, ci mu1 minus mu2, we get the 90% confidence interval is calculated as 26,500 plus or minus 19,544, which equals a confidence interval from a minimum of $6,956 to a maximum of $46,044. The 95% confidence interval is equal to 26,500 plus or minus 23,951. And you can see, we can see that the margin of error increases because we have a larger uh, confident level of confidence and therefore a wider confidence interval. And that works out to a confidence interval that goes from $2,549 up to $50,451. And finally, the 99% confidence interval will equal 26,500 plus or minus 33,799, the largest margin of error here, and therefore the widest confidence interval, which goes from minus $7,299 up to $60,299. So for part B, we can see that the level the at LOC values of 90% and 95%, the CIs contain only positive values. And what this and what this means, now that means that zero is not contained in either of these confidence intervals. And so what that means is that the probability that mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero exceeds the level of confidence in each case. So that would mean that the level of conf that the probability that mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero is larger than both 90% and 95%, which of course means it's, it's greater than 95%. Therefore, this would support a claim that mu1 is greater than mu2 at these levels of confidence. On the other hand, at LOC equals 99%, the CI contains both negative and positive values. In other words, the CI contains the value of zero inside. And what that means is that the probability that mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero is going to be less than 99%. Therefore, this would not support a claim that mu1 is greater than mu2. Rather, we would say that the sample data is inconclusive about which of mu1 and mu2 are greater. In the preceding example, we were looking at samples of house resale prices from two separate towns. These samples are independent because the data in each sample comes from entirely different houses from the two separate towns. And it's assumed that the house resale prices from one town are independent of those from the other. In other cases, however, we might be interested in making comparisons where the same group of individuals are measured under two different sets of conditions. Examples of this include the following. We might be looking at heart rates of people before and after drinking a cup of a certain brand of decaffeinated coffee. Or we might be looking at the performance of students on exams with or without the allowed use of a calculator. Or we might be looking at distances traveled by hikers on a mountain trail on sunny versus overcast days. In studies such as these, we collect two samples which are typically of a before-after nature. However, these samples are not independent of each other because each individual value from one sample has a corresponding value in the other. These are paired samples, and what we are specifically interested in is the difference between each of these corresponding pairs of values. Let us refer to each corresponding pair of values as xi1 and xi2, where xi1 equals the before measurement of the i's data pair, and xi2 equals the after measurement of that data pair. We can therefore define the difference for the i's data pair as follows. We say that di equals the after minus the before, which equals xi2 minus xi1. 
Now, notice that in this case, we're subtracting the first sample value from the second one, which is opposite to what we did in the previous example with independent samples. It actually makes no difference which way we subtract, as long as we're consistent within each example that we do, and as long as we keep track of what a positive versus negative result means. In other words, if we subtract smaller values from larger ones, we get positive differences, well, if we subtract the other way around, we simply get the same difference, but with a negative sign. The reason for preferring to do the subtraction xi2 minus xi1 is that it gives us after minus before, for which a positive value means a positive change over time and vice versa. So we can now establish the following definitions. First of all, the population parameter of interest here is what we call mu d, which equals the mean difference in the quantity of interest from before to after. This means that there is a single sample of interest here, consisting of n different values di, where i goes from 1 to n. So we have d1, d2, all the way through dn. Now note, the two sample sizes here must be the same as measurements are paired and not in isolation. That's why a single sample size, n equals the number of pairs, is used. So we calculate the mean difference. It's, we call it d bar, and that, as you can imagine, would equal the sum of all the di's divided by n. And Similar to how we've calculated standard deviations before, the standard deviation of these differences we call SD, and that equals the square root of n times the sum of the d squareds minus the sum of the d's, all squared, divided by n times n minus 1. The formula for the confidence interval for the population difference therefore becomes as follows. We say that ci mu d is approximately equal to d bar plus or minus t alpha over 2 degrees freedom equals n minus 1 times sd all over the square root of n. In example 4, a company sells a brand of decaffeinated coffee, which it claims has no effect on the heart rates of people who drink it. To test this claim, a group of 10 volunteer subjects was randomly selected and given a cup of this drink with their heart rates in beats per minute or BPM measured before and after drinking it. The data obtained is in the table below on the slide. So you see the table and you've got the way the data is organized is as follows. We've got the first column is the uh, subject's names, so they're just uh, labeled or named uh, 1 through 10. So we see there's a sample size here of 10. And each of those subjects has two measurements taken, heart rate before in BPM and heart rate after in BPM. So each row in the table corresponds to uh, a specific uh, subject, a specific individual in the sample. We're asked to calculate, we're asked to um, then answer the following. Part A, we're asked to calculate an unbiased point estimate for the net change in heart rate that people experience after drinking this coffee. In part B, assuming that the net change in heart rate due to drinking this coffee tends towards a normal distribution, calculate 90%, 95%, and 99% confidence intervals for the population mean net change in heart rate resulting from the consumption of this drink. And finally, in Part C, we're asked to comment on what the CIs from Part B suggest about the company's claim that this drink has no effect on drinkers' heart rates. So we proceed to answer this problem. We start with defining mu d equal to the population mean net change in heart rate in BPM resulting from drinking this decaffeinated coffee. So this mu d actually equals the true average in the population. Now you can imagine that this is a very elusive population mean because the only way we could ever collect it would be to actually get everyone in the population to drink this coffee, which they probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to do. 
all of them. So this is a, a very uh, sort of an excellent example of a problem where there's no way to do a census. So we rely only on, on estimates from samples. So to answer the questions, we first augment the data table by calculating the values that we need to calculate. And the columns that we need to add here are for D and D squared. And then we total both of these columns because we need those for the calculations of, of um, X bar D and or of D bar and for S D. So you can see the table has that the, the we can see the augmented table on the slide here with the extra two columns. And the differences are simply calculated as the after minus the before. And we can see uh, that we've got some positive and some negative values and then the total. And then uh, each of the D values is squared as we'll need that particular, um, we'll, we'll need that information for the calculation of SD. So to answer part A, an unbiased point estimate of mu D is D bar. So we calculate D bar by taking the sum of the DIs, which equals 12 divided by N, which is 10. So that gives us a D bar equal to 1.2 BPM, and that's a positive 1.2. So what that means is that the average change in heart rate from before to after is an increase of 1.2 beats per minute. In part B, we calculate the confidence interval for uh, the, the difference here. So the confidence interval estimate for mu D is approximately equal to D bar plus or minus T alpha over two, df equals n minus 1 times sd over the square root of n. So there's uh, a few things that we need to figure out here. Um, the first thing we need to figure out is what the sd is. So using the formula for sd, we input the values. We have uh, we end up with the square root of 10 times, uh, so we've got n equals 10 times the sum of the d squares, and that's the sum of the last column in the table on the right, so that's 350, minus the square of the sum of the d's, which is 12, which is the sum of the d column. So the top, the numerator inside the square root is 10 times 350 minus 12 squared, and then we divide by n times n minus 1, which is 10 times 9. So what we get is the square root of 3,356 over 90, so we substitute that into our CI mu D equation. And what we get is that the CI mu D is equal to 1.2 plus or minus the, the T for alpha over two and degrees freedom equal to, now in all, in all, for all confidence intervals, we'll use the same degrees of freedom of N minus one, which is 10 minus one, which is nine times the square root of th uh, three, 3356 over 90 that we just calculated for SD. And then we divide it by the square root of 10. Now a little bit of mathematical manipulation here will allow us to simplify this a bit. So we get that the CI mu D equals 1.2 plus or minus T. And then we note that uh, alpha is one minus LOC over, alpha is one minus LOC. So we want the T of alpha the T of one minus LOC over two and degrees freedom equals nine times the square root of 3,356 divided by 30. And that's a little bit of mathematical um, simplification using the square roots that we had on top and bottom. So the resulting confidence intervals we can see on the slide here. Um, and, and we have for the LOCs from 90% through 99%, we see that the only difference, of course, in the calculation is going to be in the T value. And for LOC from 90 through 99%, uh, respectively, we get um, alpha over two values of 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and 0 0.005, as, we, as we've seen before. And so what we get then are corresponding T values, respectively, of 1.833, 2.262 and 3.250. So when we in substitute those values into the formula for CI mu D, we get the following three confidence intervals. The 90% confidence interval goes from minus 2.3 to 4.7. 
the 95% confidence interval goes from minus 3.2 to 5.6, and the 99% confidence interval goes from minus 5.1 to 7.5. And, and as is generally the case, we can see that as the level of confidence increases, the confidence intervals get wider. So to answer part C, we can see that each of the CI mu d's include the value 0. In other words, they go from a negative value to a positive value, which means that it is not clear whether mu d is greater than 0, or, even, or less than 0 for that matter, which is what that also implies, even at the lowest LOC of 90%. In other words, although the point estimate that we get from this sample, the d bar, is positive, it equals positive 1.2 beats per minute, which does suggest that this decaffeinated coffee might increase people's heart rates on average. The probability that this is the case based on the sample data, and as we can see in the confidence intervals here, is less than 90%. As with population means, we can generate an unbiased point estimate for the difference between two population proportions, P1 minus P2 by simply subtracting the corresponding sample proportions from random samples obtained from each population, provided that the samples are independent of each other. In other words, that would mean that successes or failures, so to speak, in one sample have no influence on those in the other sample. In other words, we can say that P bar 1 minus P bar 2 is an unbiased estimator of P1 minus P2. Now, recall from the previous lesson that for sufficiently large sample sizes, we can generate confidence intervals for population proportions using the normal distribution. In other words, using Z instead of T. We can extend this to interval estimation of the difference between two population proportions, P1 minus P2. The formula for such confidence intervals is as follows. We say that the CI P1 minus P2 is equal to P bar 1 minus P bar 2 plus or minus Z alpha over 2 times the square root of P bar 1 times 1 minus P bar 1 over N1 plus P bar 2 times 1 minus P bar 2 over N2. In example five, we return to the situation of example two, where the market gardener wants to compare the germination rates of two varieties of lettuce seeds, white cos and long romaine. Using the sample data from that example, we're asked to do the following. In part A, we're asked to calculate 90, 95, and 99% confidence interval estimates for the difference between the germination rates for the two varieties of lettuce seed. And in part B, we're asked to comment on whether or not the confidence intervals provide a compelling indication that one of the seed varieties has a higher germination rate than the other. So to answer this question, we start as usual by defining P1 and P2 as the germination rates for all of the white cos and long romaine lettuce seeds respectively. In example two, we calculated the unbiased point estimate for P1 minus P2, and that worked out to be minus 0.095. To answer part A then, we use the formula developed for CI P1 minus P2, which is approximately equal to minus 0 0.095 plus or minus Z alpha over two, or Z1 minus LOC over two, times the square root of, 0.575 times 0.425 over 200 plus 0.67 times 0.33 over 100. So the only difference that there'll be uh, in the three different uh, confidence intervals is the value for a Z of alpha over two. Now for 90%, the alpha over two equals 0 0.05, for 95% it's 0 0.025, and for 99% it's 0 0.005. And so the Z values that correspond are respectively 1.645, 1.960, and 2.576. So putting all that into the formula, we get the following three confidence intervals. 90% confidence interval goes from minus 0.191 to 0 0.001. 
the 95% confidence interval goes from minus 0 0.210 to 0 0.020, and the 99% confidence interval goes from minus 0.246 to 0 0.056. So for part B, we see that at each LOC, the CI P1 minus P2 contains the value zero. In other words, each of the confidence, confidence intervals starts at a negative value and ends at a positive value, meaning that even though the sample data gives us a point estimate suggesting that P1 is less than P2, the level of confidence for such a conclusion appears to be less than 90%. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from MRSA Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.